Welcome to the pastor's office. I'm glad you can join us again today. We want to continue to take a look at a book by Dr. J. Adams called A Theology of Christian Counseling. In our first uh, video, we read through his preface and I made some opening comments with regard to Dr. Adams and his work and also what we hope to achieve with these videos. We want to continue today with our uh, study in Dr. Adams's book and we'll take a look at the introduction to his book where he gives us a broad panorama of what he hopes to um, show us in the uh, course of his book. Um, I think you'll find his introductory comments helpful for orienting you to the whole idea of Christian counseling, um, a very important subject within the church today as there are all kinds of folks who um, present themselves as Christian counselors and just what do they mean by that? What does scripture say about that kind of thing? Um, and are they exercising godly counsel or are they adapting the world's counsel and bringing it into the church with a kind of cover, veneer, or amalgamation of scriptures themselves. So we'll take a look at Dr. Adams' introduction to uh, his book and uh, then we'll proceed from there. As our practice is, I will make uh, running comments along the way to hopefully elucidate uh, his uh, remarks, which sometimes may seem to be rather condensed or contain uh, perspectives or terminology that you may not be used to. And I hope that I'll be able to uh, bring them down uh, to a point where you will find it uh, helpful. So, here we go. In the introduction, Dr. Adams writes as follows. All counselors have one goal in common, change. Moreover, as diverse as the various counseling systems may be, and they are quite distinct fundamentally, they all first see a need for change, second, use verbal means to bring about the change, which third, is purported to be for the benefit of the counselee. I remember years ago uh, meeting with Dr. Adams in Abilene, Texas, where he held a seminar and uh, in that conference he reviewed the various schools of psychology uh, in secular studies and noted that at that time, and this was back in the mid-1980s, at that time there were, if my memory is correct, over 132 different schools, completely different and distinct schools of psychology such that if you were a follower of Freud or Carl Rogers or uh, B.F. Skinner or what have you, you would have a different understanding, a uh, different perception of who uh, the counselee is, different uh, methods for addressing the counselee's needs, what their, the, the uh, origin of their problems are, how they developed, uh, what kind of therapy could be used to uh, address those needs. There were, over 132 different schools of psychology with completely different points of view. Now that provides you a sense for the kind of confusion and uh, um, disagreements that are abroad there in psychology. Now I imagine that over the years there have been a multiple of those different schools of psychology or an attempted amalgam, uh, kind of an amalgamation of all these different uh, points of view. Um, but they do have these things in common which are fairly uh, simple. They're, they see a need for change in the part of the counselee. They use verbal means to bring about that change. And then finally that change that they hopefully bring about in the counselee is purported or supposed to be for the counselee's good. Uh, they should have some benefit <laughs> from their uh, experience. Dr. Adams says, but these are the same three essential elements that I have shown elsewhere that are inherent in Nuthesia, the principal and the fullest biblical word for counseling. Nuthesia is a Greek word which occurs in Romans chapter 15, uh, verse 14, 
which uh, means to admonish. Uh, and this is going to be a, a, a theme word for Dr. Adams' approach to Christian counseling. Now, his counseling attempts to be uh, biblically oriented, grounded and rooted in the exegesis of Scripture and the application of Scripture to the counselee. Uh, but he uses nuthesia, or nuthetic, counseling as a description of it, as a differentiating description of his view of uh, Christian counseling. So, nuthetic counseling. In fact, I think, as I may have mentioned in the previous video, you can find more about Dr. Adams at his website, which is nuthetic.org. Uh, nuthetic, N-O-U-T-H-E-T-I-C, nuthetic.org, O-R-G. Uh, so he goes on, the Bible itself provides the principles for understanding and for engaging in nuthetic counseling and directs Christian ministers to do such counseling as a part of their life calling in the ministry of the Word. Other Christians also should counsel as God gives opportunity. In other words, uh, Dr. Adams, especially in his book, Competent to Counsel, but uh, only incidentally here, notes that Christian pastors are responsible principally for counseling members in Christ's church. But also, individual members may be trained to know how to counsel others within their families, within their sphere of influence, at the job, in the church, and so forth. We all should be engaged in nuthesia, uh, nuthetic counseling, addressing one another from God's word. Therefore, he says, those who develop other systems based on other sources of information by which they attempt to achieve these same ends by the very nature of the case become competitive. It is dangerous to compete with the Bible since all such competition in the end turns out to be competition with God. And I would suggest to you that all such competition is... Um, comprehensive in nature. Uh, it is totalitarian, we might put it, in the sense that it intends to push out other points of view. If you were to come to a secular counselor after the order of a Carl Rogers or uh, uh, Abram Maslow or what have you, and expect to find Christian views, Christian values, having a relationship with God in Christ as being fundamental to change in your life, they would certainly push back and resist that. Uh, they would have no room for that in their counseling approach. Now, Carl Rogers might suggest you need to find your own way to um, discover your, your yourself and to address your particular needs. Uh, and he might see the counselor as kind of a therapist to help you find your way along to that end. And if Christian thoughts are what appeals to you, then perhaps he'd try to work around that and develop that within you. But I suspect that deep down his interest would be in helping you to see from his perspective that faith in God or faith in an authoritative, infallible word is not going to help you. You need to solve these things on your own and not depend on this kind of thing. So uh, we'll, we'll cover that more further. But Adams says those different points of view are competitive with the Bible. And I would say they as competitors would seek to push out, remove uh, from the field of view uh, a, a uh, Bible-oriented, God-centered, Christ-centered uh, way of counseling. Adam says, It is not that Christians oppose competition as such. That is not the problem. But when they are faithful to God... Christians must deplore any and all concepts, methods, systems, etc. that are set up in competition with God's concepts, methods, and systems. When pagan approaches are developed to do what God has given the Bible to do, these approaches must be exposed, rejected, and opposed. So, competing points of view... Uh, that are out there are not a problem per se, but the Christian point of view must oppose them, and Christians need to uh, fix themselves upon the, the 
concepts, ideas, systems that God has presented for helping them in this world. Contrary to what some may think, Christians may have not suddenly burst, excuse me, Contrary to what some may think, Christians have not suddenly burst upon the scene challenging psychiatrists and clinical and counseling psychologists. Rather, the historical facts show that the latter are the newcomers who moved in to supplant the church in its work of counseling. Historically speaking, therefore, competition is quite an accurate word to describe the situation. Um, what Adam is going to say is that the, the cure of souls, what used to be called the cure of souls on the part of pastors, is the way the people, uh, at least within Christian communities, sought to find help for their psychological problems or seek counsel and advice for how to handle different problems in life. So they came to their pastor for that kind of counsel. It's only been in recent years, over the last century or so, that psychology has developed as an independent science competing with the Christian pastor and suggesting that the Christian pastor does not have the scientific tools necessary to address real human problems. So, uh, Dr. Adams will uh, argue against that. But in any case... Christians have been on the scene for centuries providing counsel for their members, whereas the, the science of psychology is only a recent phenomenon. At one time, counseling was considered to be an integral part of the work of Christ's church. Ministers wrote books on melancholy or depression. They held counseling sessions with inquirers who were concerned not only with conversion, but with every phase of their lives. The church ministered to families and persons in every sort of human-human and human-divine relationship. Note that this ministry covered a broader scope than modern competitive systems allow for. In other words, the modern systems, the psychologists, don't allow for our relationship with God as being fundamental and transformative of our relationships to others. The whole uh, realm of the divine is, for most uh, secular psychologists, stripped away and removed from view. And instead, all problems are solved on a horizontal human level, from a, a, a secular psychology point of view. The public recognized that it was the task of the church in general, and of pastors in particular, to attend to matters of belief, attitude, value, behavior, relationship, etc. Now, psychotherapists attempt to usurp that role. So, competition has moved in. And uh, a lot of people are concerned about coming to the pastor anymore for counseling because psychology has developed such a science and has such an air of uh, scientific acumen that approaching a pastor with regard to certain issues may seem to be uh, not consulting the most skilled individual. You need somebody who specializes in uh, different uh, psychological problems. How then was it possible for the church to lay aside its God-given task so easily and turn the work over to others who proposed different ways of going about it? Ways that not only differed from the biblical pattern, but competed and conflicted with it. I have detailed, says Dr. Adams, I have detailed some of the principal factors involved in the psychiatric takeover elsewhere. And you can consult his lectures on counseling. Uh, and I shall not repeat that story here. Rather, I should like to add one more, one that is pertinent to the very essence of this book. Truths that the church does not treat systematically, in other words, theologically, it has a tendency to lose. Did you catch what he said there? The church needs to formulate, uh, in a systematic fashion, its understanding or its concepts about God, scriptures, man, man's nature, man's problem, the remedy for man's problem through redemption, the work of Christ, uh, the process of sanctification, 
the church needs to formulate these ideas in succinct, systematic ways so that the, the people of God may be strengthened and taught, built up in their faith, and protected against uh, alternative points of view. And when the church has failed to develop this systematic understanding of the concepts of Scripture, then you become vulnerable to all different kinds of points of view, which is what has happened today. Uh, I am concerned that so often the church uh, makes use of uh, a teaching method which uh, uh, focuses so much on individual trees that it misses the whole forest. It misses the, a broader point of view. Whether you consider that point of view from a biblical theological perspective and the development of uh, biblical themes through, throughout the course of Scripture or a systematic theological approach where you uh, summarize the full teaching of Scriptures on one particular uh, topic, I think the church has not sufficiently developed on a pastoral level within the local congregations has not sufficiently developed this kind of um, ministry. Uh, I think that's why it's so important within Reformed churches uh, to have classrooms dedicated to a study of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the larger and shorter catechisms. Uh, it's important for parents, for fathers, to train up their families with the use of the catechisms of the church, the shorter and larger catechisms, so that family members can grow, grow up with succinct or um, uh, complete ideas about what the scripture says on basic issues of Christian living. Okay, back to Dr. Adams. Why the change occurred. The pressures that had a part in compressing and shrinking the church's counseling role were able to make headway and indeed all but succeeded in totally supplanting it because even though counseling by its nature was theological through and through, it had been carried on in an unsystematic, a-theological manner. In other words, there wasn't a clear conception of what Scripture has to say about the basic topics of man and uh, redemption. When doctrine becomes creedal, uh, for example, like the Athanasian Creed, it becomes defensible against Arians and other heretics. Heresy, as well as truth, becomes identifiable. Before it takes creedal form, however, almost any sort of heresy can claim a place. Controversy over the Bible's teaching on various points led to the formulation of theological statements that have helped us not only to identify falsehood and defend the truth, but also to teach and to restudy biblical teaching in a deeper and more profitable way. Future generations can stand on the shoulders of past ones and reach even higher on the tree of truth for fruit yet unplucked. Many doctrines have been so defined helpfully, but to date no serious theological, let alone creedal, statements have been made about the place or task of counseling in the Christian church. A lot there. Um, our churches make use of a variety of creeds. In our worship services we recite the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. Uh, perhaps you're acquainted with the Athanasian Creed or others th from church history. Um, uh, you also have the great confessions of the church, the Belgic, the Synod of Dort, the Westminster Confession, uh, all different summaries, the, the um, uh, Heidelberg Catechism, all these different summaries of the Christian faith. These creedal and confessional documents serve the church by distinguishing truth from falsehood. And that's an important point in your maturity as a Christian. You need to be able to grow to the point where you can identify what the truth is and distinguish it from that which is false. Or when you're receiving something which is false, you need to be able to discern uh, why it is false and uh, hold to that which is true. So creeds, confessions, uh, catechisms, these things help us to have a clear grasp of the truth. And that way they protect us from error. 
They join us together as those who are mutually committed to this understanding of Scripture. Excuse me. And they also challenge us over time to go ever, ever, and ever deeper into the meaning of Scripture. And so you can go from creeds to confessions and catechisms to books on theology, systematic theologies, biblical theologies, and it just goes on and on and on as our understanding of Scripture grows. And over 2,000 years, the church's understanding of Scripture has indeed uh, made great strides over the years, and there is still, I'm sure, much more to learn. Dr. Adams' particular concern is having a uh, doctrine uh, or a, a kind of creedal statement or confessional statement as it has to do with counseling. In other words, counseling is a specific application of the Word of God to certain situations in the life of God's people. And Dr. Adams thinks we ought to have a theological structure for that counseling to take place. And maybe it'll rise up to the form of a creed, I, I, I rather doubt that, but at least there needs to be a theological underpinning for all true Christian counseling. We have to examine what our theological presuppositions are so that we can be sure that the counseling we provide is helpful. It's uh, guided by the Word of God and not just bringing in all kinds of different points of view under the label of Christian counseling because a Christian is doing it. It is my hope that out of the present controversy over the problem of eclectic counseling within Christ's church, there the issue is whether the counseling systems of Freud, Rogers, Skinner, not to speak of scores of others, can be brought legitimately into the church. Uh, it's Dr. Adams' uh, conviction that theological studies will be generated that will lead to clear definitions of the work of the church and her counseling ministry, so that congregations and their members will better understand the perils involved. In my opinion, advocating allowing and practicing psychiatric and psychoanalytical dogmas within the church is every bit as pagan and heretical and therefore perilous as propagating the, teachers, the teachings of some of the most bizarre cults. The only vital difference is that the cults are less dangerous because their errors are more identifiable since they are controverted by existing creedal statements. Uh, so, Dr. Adams is going to argue against an eclectic approach to Christian counseling. That is to say, a, a, a view that says, well, I've got my Bible on the one hand, but I can learn from Freud and Skinner and Rogers and Maslow and all the rest of them, and incorporate their best insights with what the Bible has to say and, and come up with this kind of amalgamated or, or uh, conjoined uh, approach. To scriptures and consider that a Christian point of view. Uh, what Dr. Adams says is that we need to keep the kinds of ideas that Freud and others espoused out of the church, out of Christian counseling, because they are harmful. They are like the cults long ago that uh, affected the church by their false teaching. It is also my hope that this theological study of Christian counseling, primitive and incomplete though it may be, nevertheless will provide an impetus for other such studies, leading at length to the sharper redefinitions and theological commitments that are so essential and yet almost entirely lacking. We often have been told that all truth is God's truth, and that if Paul were alive today, he would have borrowed much from modern psychotherapists. Unfortunately, say they, Paul is not alive, not now alive, so the point cannot be tested. But on the contrary, the thesis can be tested. We are not left to speculation and guessing about this matter. We can discover whether or not he was an eclectic. Paul does not live on this earth at present, nor did, nor did Albert Ellis live in Paul's day. But Epictetus and other Stoics did. And Ellis has gained much from Stoicism. Epictetus is one of his favorites. So we may ask, did Paul borrow from Stoicism? Did he recognize truth 
in the system and adapted to his work. Listen to some quotations from Epictetus. It sounds like Ellis himself writing. Epictetus writes as follows. Men are not disturbed by things, but by the views they take of things. Thus death is nothing terrible. Demand not that events should happen as you wish, but wish them to happen as they do happen. What hurts is not this occurrence itself, but the view he chooses to take of it. Now, did you see what Epictetus is saying? It's a very modern concept. What counts is not the events that happen to you in the world around you, but your perception of them, what you make of them. It's almost an existential point of view here. You make your own world. Yeah, you've got various things happening and going on all around you, but you don't have to respond to them in certain ways. You can control your mind and control the way that you perceive the world or accept what the world does. That was the view of Epictetus, and it's a very modern point of view as well today. Of course, the problem is you end up living in an imaginary world, a world of your own construction, a fantasy world, where you try to force things into your own uh, intellectual grid, which may have little to do with the reality, and so there are self-deceiving. Um, so there's the danger of... Uh, that kind of existentialist uh, psychology. But back to Dr. Adams. Did Paul buy into Stoicism? Did, in other words, Paul borrow from Stoicism and, and speak highly of the truths that he found in the Stoic philosophers? Not at all. This was not his approach. That he knew all about Stoicism is apparent from Acts chapter 17, verse 18. His neglect was not due to ignorance. And from that passage, it is equally plain that Paul was no Stoic. Indeed, Paul found himself in conflict with Stoic philosophers. He uncompromisingly insisted that they must repent. Verse 30. Not only was such a must out of character with Stoic philosophy, but by requiring repentance, Paul was calling for a radical change an abandonment of their Stoic thinking that would lead to a radical change in lifestyle. The thesis of eclecticism, when tested, fails to materialize. Now, I wanted to read from you, for you, uh, Acts 17 and verse 18. You remember, Paul has gone to the city of Athens, and he meets with the Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill, and they want to find out what is this uh, teaching that uh, Paul is bringing into their midst. And uh, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, uh, makes the kind of subtle uh, comment that they had nothing better to do all day than to argue about different things like this there in Athens. In any case, we get to Acts 17, verse 18, where Paul is uh, dealing with the Epicureans and, and uh, Here's the verse. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So Paul had conversations with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. He knew what they were saying. He knew their concepts and their ideas. And contrary to their point of view, he was proclaiming his own point of view, rooted in Jesus and the resurrection. And this is uh, what he would challenge. And as you go through his sermon that would follow, he quotes some of the poets and these kinds of things, but he demonstrates that he, at, at the end, uh, the, the fundamental difference between his point of view and that of everything else you could find there in Athens by calling upon these philosophers to repent to repent or have a change of mind with regard to their philosophy, their point of view, to repent and turn to God, accept God's way of dealing with things. And that way only comes through faith in Jesus uh, in his death and resurrection. And uh, so Paul, rather than endorsing or embracing the ideas of, of Stoicism, calls the Stoics to repent and change their point of view. In summing up my position, Dr. Adams writes, then, 
Perhaps I can best express it in the crisp form that was necessary for writing a brief exhortation in the September 2nd, 1977 issue of Kediv Query. Um, pardon me if I don't pronounce that correctly. A student publication at Dallas Theological Seminary. Let me quote that short article here in full. The basis for Christian counseling. The Christian's basis for counseling and the basis for a Christian's counseling is nothing other than the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. The Bible is his counseling textbook. Why, you ask? After all, the Christian doesn't use the Bible as his basis for scores of other activities in which he engages, such as engineering, architecture, music. So why should he insist that the scriptures are the basis for counseling? The answer to that question is at once both simple and profound. Because of its simplicity, don't miss the profundity of its implications. The Bible is the basis for a Christian's counseling because it deals with the same issues that all counseling does. The Bible was given to help men come to saving faith in Christ and then to transform believers into His image. You can read about that in 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 through 17. The Holy Spirit uses it as an adequate instrument that he says has the power to do so. That, in substance, is what these verses say. Now, let me remind you of those verses by reading them for you. They are verses that I think most Christians are very familiar with, but perhaps don't appreciate their significance for counseling. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, his uh, child in the faith, uh, let me pick it up at verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly, firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Remember what Dr. Adams said, the Bible is the textbook for counseling. God's Word addresses us in our human situation and has all that we need to help us deal with our problems. Our problems essentially are problems of sin. And the Scriptures are given to counsel us with regard to that problem. They point us to Jesus Christ who takes away our sins and places within us a new nature. They show us how that new nature ought to live. And everything that we need to live a godly life, to live a good life, is given to us in the pages of Scripture. And so the counselor should work from Scripture to address the problems in the counselee's life and not work from the the psychologies of, of various uh, secularists who, whose system is at heart inimical or hostile to biblical Christian faith. So the scriptures are the textbook for the counselor. He goes on, but note too in these verses God assigns this life calling of transforming lives by the word to the man of God. A phrase Paul picks up from the Old Testament designation for a prophet and uses in the pastoral epistles to refer to the Christian minister. And let me repeat, the Holy Spirit strongly declares that the Bible fully equips him for this work. So then, it is because counseling, the process of helping others to love God and their neighbors, because counseling is a part of the ministry of the Word, just as preaching is, that it is unthinkable to use any other text, just as it would be unthinkable to do so in preaching. A ministry of the Word is not such when it is based on substitutes. You might think of it this way. The ministry of the Word comes to us in two forms. It comes to us publicly through the preaching of the Word, and privately through pastoral counseling. 
This is the full ministry of God's Word in our midst. God addresses us from Sunday to Sunday in a corporate setting in the congregation of God's people. And in public ways, God calls us to faith and obedience. But there's also that private ministry that pastors have within the lives of their congregation, whether within homes with uh, uh, families all gathered together around the pastor or privately and individually, either in the pastor's office or uh, in some other private location, uh, there is this pastoral responsibility to preach the word through counseling, private one-on-one -on -one individual instruction as to how God wants us to live. And as a result, since it's all rooted in a ministry of the word, then the one textbook for both preaching and for private counseling is the scriptures. And we would no more change the Bible as a textbook for preaching than we would for private counseling. They're both rooted in the scriptures. The Bible is the basis for a Christian's counseling because of what counseling is all about. Changing lives by changing values, beliefs, relationships, attitudes, behavior. What other source can provide a standard for such changes? What other source tells us how to make such changes in a way that pleases God? That is why other foundations for counseling must be rejected. Not only are they not needed, the Bible is adequate. The unique one, who is the counselor, proved that by his own counseling ministry. But since they seek to do the same sorts of things without the Scripture and the Spirit, they are also competitive. The secular psychologists are competitive with the Christian pastor in his ministry of uh, healing souls. God doesn't bless his competition, that's uh, to say the least. Uh, nor does he bless disobedience to his word by his servants, pastors, and members of the congregation. As future ministers of the word, and remember he's writing to students at Dallas Theological Seminary, as future ministers of the word, be just that, only that, and nothing else but that, ministers of the word. Do not forsake the fountain of living water, for the cracked cisterns of modern counseling systems. So in this er opening chapter in Dr. Adams' book, this introduction, he gives us a, a, a broad perspective for what we can hope to uh, develop in the weeks that are ahead. Essentially, he's arguing against not only secular uh, psychology on its own, he will argue with them, but also the attempts made by uh, Christians uh, who are rather naive or some who profess Christian faith but truly are not Christians, the attempt to uh, draw uh, secular psychology into the church, into the counseling ministry, supplanting the scriptures as the foundation for our uh, counseling ministry and replacing that foundation with psychological concepts, ideas, values, behaviors, uh, means of treating people uh, that is hostile to God's interest and God's purpose for his people. So, secular psychology, eclectic attempts at merging Christian faith and the best insights, if you will, of secular counseling and Christian counsel counseling. Those are the areas that we're going to be looking at. And Adams, of course, will argue that we need an exegetical approach to Christian counseling, de developing a theology of counseling that addresses the real needs in God's way uh, and, and for God's purpose in our lives. So uh, I hope that while well, this has been a little bit long, and these chapters are going to be a little bit long as we get on into the text, I hope that you will find that this is challenging. Uh, most especially when we get into the next couple of chapters, Adams is going to start blowing your mind with the kinds of things that he is going to be saying. It's uh, earth-breaking stuff. I mean, truly, uh, you will find a, a great upheaval in the kinds of things that you've just been accustomed to assume. And uh, he will break away a lot of that stuff, and he'll give you uh, a tremendous new 
insights and concepts and ideas to help you walk before God and enjoy God's blessing. And that's our goal, that you would be healed, that I would be healed, that we would be blessed by God and walk uh, for Him. So thank you for watching and we look forward to seeing you next time.